And for them, a renaissance meant that they uh, took the whole building, they, they gutted it, they created a whole series of new exhibition spaces, library spaces, um, got rid of certain programs, introduced a series of interior vertical circulation cores, which were highly uh, um, criticized by the public at first, have been accepted. The idea being that all circulation of, is, of course, externalized to the outside, back and front. Um, we were contacted towards the end of that period, uh, and they wanted, Santa Pompidou wanted uh, the competitors to create or imagine a restaurant that would be open during the day, but also open during the night uh, beyond the t uh, closing hours of the Santa Pompidou and would be, in a sense, a place that would be somehow also linked in with this idea of a rebirth or a, or a new kind of uh, event inside the existing, uh, inside the, the exoskeleton of the existing building. So what we became extremely interested in in the project was a number of problems, well, a number of problems, of course, became very evident to us. One was that we couldn't attach ourselves to any of the walls. Um, they, two of them, of course, were glass uh, and pr highly protected. Centre Pompidou, of course, everyone knows, is, is more or less like you know, France's probably one of my, France's most famous monuments beyond the Eiffel Tower. It's preserved, uh, and uh, I'm using the words sarcastically because, of course, it wasn't meant to be that in its very nature. At the very beginning, the idea was that it was a as a, as a series of um, uh, tager, uh, uh flat trays on which then events would be slid in and slid out. Uh, today, as we know, it's a lot more fixed uh, within, its, within its nature. Uh, but what we were, were very interested in was this idea that, okay, we wouldn't be able to touch the exterior. The exterior walls on this side are opaque and we can't uh, attach to them because they're security walls. Uh, firewalls, and then the, the roof, as you, as you know, the, all the uh, plumbing ducting of Pompidou, which is uh, highly uh, charged with its vocabulary, is untouchable. So what we had is the sort of the sixth face of the rectangle was the floor. So we knew we, the only thing we could really play with, essentially, uh, was to work with the floor and to work with essentially the idea of the floor coming out onto the terrace. And then the other thing that interested, in, interested us in all of this history was to somehow find something in the Centre Pompidou that was uh, completely neutral and divorced from its vocabulary. Now, the only thing that we found in the end was an increment, which was 80 centimeters by 80 centimeters, which divides uh, the, the fabric of Pompidou in multiplications of that, you get to 160, 320, 12, 20, uh, 1280, pardon, between the, the structural grid. And vertically, it becomes divided by this grid. So for us then, we had two things that we were extremely interested in. The fact that the floor was an available site, and the grid was also something available and devoid from its vocabulary. Outside of that, we had the problem with the program, which we then took the program and divided it into a series of chunks which we said, well, why don't we then try and imagine a, a building in parallel to these chunks which could somehow be slid under the floor. So we considered then the floor a conceptual carpet. Uh, and by sliding the program underneath, we then, in a, in a sense, uh, both uh, lost the program, uh, at which point we also became very interested in this idea that by camouflaging the, the restaurant itself, one would only go to this place and eat and sit down on a stair, uh, on a chair, sorry, and nothing else would be visible. Of course, the contradictions of a project always come out and emerge and appear and you work with those as you go along. These are really sketches. This, these are very early numeric sketches, uh, numeric overlaid by hand. The idea of this uh, carpet and how we could relate to that and how we could relate, start to relate to this ceiling or not. So this is a very crude early beginnings, uh, axonometric view looking down. So this volume essentially becomes, at one point we decided, so this is a bathroom volume, this is the kitchen volume, a huge mass uh, of kitchens that was needed. This is a bar, 
And then this is a private dining room that was also a public, became a public dining room as well, which was needed. So these are just very early, quick, uh, actually re reworkings later. I shouldn't say early, they came afterwards. But uh, I, I think it were always important to kind of go back and see and recapitulate somehow. So, sorry. Uh, this again is a sketch uh, coming through from above. And again, sketch is starting to think about how maybe the area above was starting to relate to these volumes below. So we're moving a little bit fast here. Uh, again, sketches. And then the plan. And the plan, in this case, now having showing you essentially where people sit, which was towards the most uh, visibly interesting out towards the city area. This stuff tended to then be pushed towards the back of the site. We have a huge problem at Pompidou, which is that there's uh, an extraordinary white light of Paris, which blasts in at these windows. And then in this corner, it's pitch black, more or less. So we knew we had a lighting gradient on the diagonal, which was very important. And we knew that when people sat here, unless they got some kind of balance between both sides of the face when you were looking at them, we would be sitting on a, a, a pretty sort of ugly experience. Uh, so we wanted to try and also create with this idea of these camouflage pieces, create uh, through light uh, a reflection of sorts. Some of the, these things I'm mentioning ahead of time and we'll come back to. These are just simply the sketches, the drawings that we did for the competition. They're very neutral just to present the ideas in the very basic sense. And then after getting the competition, we uh, had to plunge ourselves into this world of then developing the project. We met with engineers. We decided Pompidou has a huge problem, which is that uh, only up to a certain weight limit can you build in Pompidou. Beyond that, it's, uh, it's, it's not possible. So we decided very quickly in the piece that we wanted to try and build these volumes out of aluminium. And they're built out of four millimeter thick aluminium, which is brushed. This, the grid, or the structure, I should say, is built also out of uh, aluminium. It's digitally cut out of one uh, centimeter thick uh, aluminium plates. And we found for this phase uh, a boat builder in La Rochelle in France who has worked on a number of America's Cup uh, boats. And what was extraordinary for us in, us in this experience was actually working all of a sudden with someone completely outside of the uh, architectural building territory. And it's something I touched on earlier in uh, the written notes that I was reading. Um, but for us at this point, I think this became very exciting because these people that we started working with extremely closely between our engineers and the boat builders were equipped with numeric technology way before us in the architecture world. Uh, today we're all on parallel grounds, but as, as late as 98 in France it was extremely, you know, ex 98, 99, extremely interesting to, and, and rather provocative, us, provocative for us to find this out. This, uh, these are uh, drawings that we had to make, of course, as uh, uh, basic communication between uh, engineers and builders. And we did a ton of these things, deciding on how skins would be attached how primary, secondary structures would be attached, and how all of that would sit in Pompidou on these things which we called uh, uh, the spring peripheriques. Now all of that meant that these things were like uh, cars. These volumes sit on these rails which are attached by springs to the floor of Centre Pompidou. And they do that because we never wanted to introduce a movement uh, joint in the volume itself. So then we had to make the volume itself actually a, a springable thing, which was kind of a hair-raising event in its, own, in its own way. But we got there by, again, working pretty closely with uh, our engineers RFR in Paris, which were a pretty exciting group. And, and themselves were very, very keen on working with the boat building work world for maybe 10 or 20 years. So it was, it was just a very special moment and a good opportunity to bring all of that together. Anyway, these are st structures and skins, structures and skins.
And then, the, the, so the, that was the bar volume. This volume is an important one. It's, we call it the, uh, the Mickey Mouse or the red volume. It's, uh, it's the volume for the conference area that I was telling you about, the private conference dining room. It's the Mickey Mouse because of the, uh, the head uh, hat that runs out and touches, just touches the window. And all of this is opened up to the restaurant or completely closed as the other image showed. These are really engineering drawings now where we're studying in minute detail how we're going to work with these skins and the structure. And then this is a kind of very sort of basic uh, uh, section, but I think it's an important one only to very quickly present to you this issue of the air, the information, and water and electricity are brought always down through the roof into these volumes. Um, our notion was appropriation. What we did was we said all of the air, water, and electricity, which are uh, painted green for water, blue for air, uh, and yellow for electricity, in their original Pompidou colors, this idea of codification uh, of the system, we left, and our notion was then to just actually appropriate. And by appropriating, not to actually touch it, but actually, in a way, direct it just down into where we needed it. The information, on the other hand, is a new thing in Pompidou. And what's exciting about that is that in the bar, for example, we have video monitors that are presenting upcoming artists' works and uh, their conceptual pieces, installation installed in the restaurant, but they have nothing to do with the restaurant. So there's a kind of double programming thing there which is very interesting. And it's something which we definitely cultivated or tried to cultivate with the Centre Pompidou. In other words, just trying to break down this idea that there's a restaurant and there's the Centre Pompidou. And very much making in a way, I mean for us it's almost not a restaurant, it's something else. And I think maybe that's also part of its success because it's not trying to be what it really is trying, it should be trying to be in some ways. Um, anyway, these are skin diagrams. These are diagrams as to how then we had to make the thing. We had to, every volume was broken into many, many pieces. These are uh, analysis drawings, which I always find fascinating. Uh, engineering analysis drawings to do with side uh, movement uh, and top movements on each volume, which we had to go through and study, and then reinforce according to where that was needed. These are pattern drawings, of course, we all know them, but they're always, uh, I think, rather rather interesting and, uh, and something which we you know, it's just part of the architectural production that is in-house uh, that all of us do to make something like this. To then know that all of these pieces have to be drawn by us as well as the boat building uh, group and then studied of course by the engineers. So this is now uh, an image inside the boat building factory where we started producing these pieces. We can see the primary, the secondary skin, uh, structure, and then the way we start to skin the, the, the beast. And we used a machine called an Eckhold machine, which is a very interesting machine. It's essentially like a huge sunflower press uh, of thousands of little points, and you can either uh, put a piece of aluminium under the Eckhold, and by bringing down these thousands of points, they either expand and create a, a, a concave curve, or uh, contract, and uh, I think that's right, either way around anyway, and create a convex curve. Uh, so that, that was part, partially interesting in terms of how we worked with the technology on the skins. Uh, in parallel to that, also I had to say that uh, there was a, an aspect of very uh, artisanal, uh, traditional boat building methods as well, in terms of skinning the piece, as we can see here. And just part of the process of going through. And then all of this was delivered over a period of time as we built them in the factory. They were delivered uh, piece by piece to Pompidou, brought up in a lift in the back, and then welded on site, and then uh, reworked on site, bolted and then welded. So the process was quite extraordinary. And the group that we built them with uh, relocated six of their guys for about five months on the site of Pompidou, full time, working away in the space. So it was definitely a project of, a lot, there was a lot of passion involved in 
in the project, a lot of you know hairy surprises at some points, wondering whether we you know get below these uh, beams, whether everything was right, and of course aluminium does have a capability of deforming a bit in transportation, so those kinds of things then made, meant more time just getting it right, adjusting it all on the side. But eventually we got there. This is a view uh, as we're getting towards the end. This is the volume of the bar. And then here we're starting to put down the floor. The floor is aluminium plate also. It's four millimeters thick. And then a finished view from the terrace. So what we have at night is, a, is an extraordinary terrace in summertime that, uh, that views into the inside and out. Our intention with the furniture was to use the furniture as an excuse to open up the terrace uh, completely to the interior so there was a, it was, there was a, sort of a seamless uh, relation spatially to interior and outside. There's a view from the Nikki Zinfandel uh, Tingley fountain below. Here is our red volume at night and here's just, just the top of the uh, yellow volume bar. And then at night looking in, uh, it's just sort of brute photos just as we're starting to, before we opened the project. The, uh, bathrooms, kitchen, uh, bar, again a similar kind of view. And then inside, very early on in the piece, a bathroom, kitchen, bar piece. And then this extraordinary roof, uh, the existing roof. And then views around the volumes. I think for us, the, uh, it didn't really go into that, but the idea of, in a way, the volumes was for us very much that the passages between the volumes were somehow created by the flux or the movements of people. So in a way, trampling across the carpet made, in a sense, all of the volumes uh, relate to essentially this one carpet surface. Here we are looking towards the, uh, the, the bar piece, of course a daytime view. What interested it also with uh, the nature of this beast was that uh, in a sense like a carpet you're not aware of when the volume is actually maybe pushing up or, uh, or falling back down. And I think in a way the vocabulary that started to, to develop uh, finally in the later stages of the project uh, was something which pleased us in the sense that we, uh, did, we intentionally wanted to leave the reading by the public of the project project as one in which it was in a process of becoming something else. And that becoming, I think, was, a, was, a, was for us quite an important aspect uh, in terms of making the project a, a, a part of an ongoing uh, project, part of an on, partially in a sense just caught in time, uh, or, as this, or as though you've just, just walked into an event as it's unfolding. Um, and partially, uh, partially all of that's related also to this notion that these people are not stupid, they're actually bright. And they want to know more about what's going on. And what is interesting with uh, the ability as an architect is that we can get people off their butts and move them. I mean, it's a sort of simplistic way to thing to say, but in some ways it's quite important, I think, that the, the person sitting in the restaurant actually actively in this space is forced into the position of a spectator. And we did want them to actually start to explore the project. And only by doing that, we, could, we knew the only way to do that was to never show anyone the whole project at any one point sitting in the restaurant. So there's this, again, this interest in, in fragmenting the project, breaking the project down, creating narrow passages, and inciting people to move and be active and thinking about what they're looking at and possibly interpreting. Um, Again, the, the brushing of the volumes is important because by brushing them, we were able to create this, uh, get this light that I was talking about back onto the uh, inner face of, one, of one's uh, face. Um, and what's fantastic in brushing the aluminium is that it both absorbs and re reflects or diffracts the light. And uh, that sort of double quality of, by brushing the aluminium was, was a very exciting quality, a little bit related to the uh, in a sense the ambiguous nature of the project and something which uh, we were quite pleased with. The aluminium is brute, we leave it uh, and it seems to survive pretty well. It just grows, it, it, it grows, it ages with the project. Uh, just, and then these are just views around the project. The inside of each project is skinned, uh, it's a second skin, outside being aluminium, and the secondary skin is in rubber. 
again, four, mil four millimeters thick. The choice is, uh, for the color is not so specific. Green, uh, in some ways, was uh, it was an allusion, of course, to this green from the earlier building uh, related to a, a water space. Um, and this is inside the, those watery spaces. And looking out through a window, again, we wanted people to think about what they were looking at. And the idea that the roof, this is an extremely important relationship between this stuff and this stuff. And what went on there wasn't just by, by accident. The furniture we designed, again, we wanted the furniture, as I said, as a, as a, as a primary uh, way of creating a level or an, uh, that ran through from outside to inside and created, in a sense, like a sea of mobilia so that people's bodies actually could register almost sort of be cut at the trunk line and that their bodies, uh, the body reading in this furniture is quite important. Spatially we wanted people to be part of a very big event with the choice of being able to be also in a very private conversation but the sense, but the sense that they also could be part of a bigger situation and the idea that people could also potentially talk to one another uh, down a line of uh, furniture is quite important. So ultimately, uh, what we do with the furniture anyway is, is, is spatially quite important to the project. Uh, this is looking towards the red volume. This is in, just outside the red volume, the one I was talking about um, earlier, with one of the walls completely closed the doors to the red volume which are open and therefore the restaurant is again used completely by the public uh, throughout the day but can be as I said double programmed closed and becomes a space for the uh, uh, meeting room or uh, 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 private lunch of the administration for Pompidou. Uh, the choice of red is in a way here it's not an accident um, either the red uh, there was an architect, a French architect called Druo, who designed uh, some rather remarkable offices for Pompidou while they moved out during the 98-2000 period. He painted the red on the inside of the offices, this fantastic red, but the, uh, and everyone knew that later in the history of this thing, all the Pompidou people would eventually move back and this red would be forgotten. So I think Dominic and I were extremely interested in the idea that this red would be, in a way, uh, somehow a, a memory. Uh, associated with this kind of earlier 98, 2000 history and also associated of course that it was their territory but all of that sort of is unstated but it, but it becomes in a way a reason or a, a resonance uh, to the piece. All of the, again the air is brought in as I said it's appropriate, it comes down, it, it punches through but it's not touched. Uh, again it's this sort of uh, displaced, odd relationship between the two things. Some people said it was this hideously ugly, this idea of destroying you know, these great volumes with your air, but the, you know, the idea is that we don't do, you know, ultimately it's for the idea of it, and that's what's, uh, that's, you know, hopefully that always rules the day. Um, in some cases you, you say no, screw it, you want to do it because it doesn't look good. <laughs> But in this case, it wasn't that, and uh, you know, it's 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 how you make architecture. Anyway, these are views around, and then that's the end of that project. Then uh, after Pompidou, we were contacted by a, a very interesting lady that had very little money. It's one of those kind of classic projects, but. Uh, but had a lot of passion for book collecting and book selling. Her name's Florence Lowy. She worked uh, for Printed Matter uh, uh, that was started by Sol Lowy in uh, New York for a number of years. She came back to Paris. Her father had originally sold books for years in the 1940s and 50s. She inherited his shop, but then wanted to create her own shop, uh, or inherited his collection, I should say, and wanted to create, create her own shop in, uh, in 2000. So she approached us and said, how can I, well, her problem was that she, half of her collection was for stock and half of it was for selling to the public. We had a, uh, an area, and these sketches are kind of important just as explanatory pieces. We had a, a volume of like 35 meters squared, which is quite tiny, um, in the Marais in Paris. And her problem was, to, as I said, to create a stock room as well as a selling a space for the public in the one space. 
So we went through numerous studies with her. I think we got to some point where she was convinced we, it, it was working out so badly between us after about five months that she was convinced we weren't going to come up with an idea. Um, at which point we came up with an idea. <laughs> Um, thank God. And what happened was that uh, we proposed that we would fill her 35 meters squared completely with books and so that no one, it wasn't uh, such an interesting idea for her of course, but that no one would be able to enter her bookstore at all and that you would only be able to see the books from the outside. That was the basic concept, but then overlaid over that concept, we said, let's imagine, and we created a virtual spectator who enters the bookstore and as a flaneur uh, uh, does uh, what the French call a parkour, which is a kind of movement in space, uh, which sometimes stops, picks up a book, puts back the book, keeps on going, wanders, gets lost, comes back, sees another book. And so with this virtual uh, uh, buyer or a fondler of books, we projected uh, the movement of this person onto the volume of books. And by doing that, we uh, essentially created this, uh, what we call this coring uh, device. And from coring the mass of books, which was essentially this volume here, and the mass, I should say, was uh, we sat down with Warrens and worked out essentially that the, her middle-sized sort of selling region uh, of what a middle-sized book could f fit into was 36 centimeters by 36 by 36. So we created a grid, a system, out of which then uh, we could essentially create what was needed for her stockroom and the public uh, uh, selling area. So these, then we, we called this coring uh, something that then created something, something called three totems. Uh, two of the totems that came through this process of coring, we then cored for a second time. And by taking out the core of that one and that one, we created the private space of the private stock room, which would then share the same shelf as the exterior uh, person or the public on this side. So if I keep on going, after coring the three totems, and then in plan the three totems, and they're of course their their complete uh, relationship within the system, and then uh, the decord numeric uh, materializations, and then of course uh, the famous pattern drawings. These pattern drawings were then sent to a, a, a wood uh, a, a furniture maker. And the intention of this was that we didn't want to use any varnish or any after Pompidou. We, we wanted to see if we could kind of go become even more extreme and get rid of as much as we could the artisanal quality. In a sense, it was like a personal bet. Um, these things can only be done he can, can only really be done to a certain degree because, of course, someone's you know we're involved with what we do and someone handles the product. But here we uh, came up with a product from Sweden, which was quite interesting. It has a melamine, matte melamine, very thin melamine stuck to both sides of what in America we'd call contra plucking, um, uh, plywood, and uh, and. Uh, essentially then we cut the pieces out uh, and the whole piece, uh, the whole thing fits together uh, like a, uh, an egg crate. These pieces were then dismounted and then re repositioned in space in the bookshop. And what we see here are these voids which where we can see through to the stock room but that's a private space. There's a small door which can be slid away and one can get inside. So the system becomes the structure, becomes the skin, but the skin is no longer there. The skinning, the de-skinning reveals the structure. And the structure is, uh, I think, in this, under these circumstances, becomes quite a rich thing. It's a double or triple meaning thing. And I think those are the kinds of conditions under which we start to be interested. Uh, this is a view from the inside of, the, of one of the uh, totems in terms of the private stockroom space, uh, another view. 
and then views around. The idea with the space was to absolutely leave all of this as simple as possible. Our intervention were these pieces. So it's white paint and a cement floor. And then from outside, again, we didn't touch the facade. It was lucky because it was there anyway. Uh, and with the books inside. And uh, the collection, if you have a chance to go to Paris, it's a fantastic collection of books. Um, it's a collection of artists' books, which are conceptualized or fabricated by artists. There's examples like Ed Ruch's Sunset Boulevard, which is sort of uh, almost a, a caricatural uh, cliche to mention. But of that whole ilk of bod the body of work uh, that one would find in printed matter, one finds here, uh, as well as a lot of French works. Uh, and it really is a remarkable collection. And what's interesting about this lady is that she treats her bookshop as also an event space. And we've had some rem remarkable, um, uh, not happenings, but sort of equivalent uh, artistic events inside the space. Okay, um, another competition we did uh, this was for the Museum Brandley in Paris. Uh, Jean Nouvel, if you come to Paris, is, uh, it's under construction. Jean Nouvel won the competition. The interesting thing here for us was that it was a museum in France they called Art Premier, or First Arts. And the idea was that it was a museum that would bring together three very important collections in France uh, and three collections of different arts from different parts of Asia, Samoa, uh, South America, the Americas, etc., etc. Uh, so the competition was uh, kind of an interesting competition. It was on a site, which I'll show you later, but uh, a very a huge site, very near the Tour Eiffel. And uh, essentially these are early, kind of, well not really early, but they're, they're essentially two uh, diag diagrams, skins that I'd like you to keep in mind. One is out of stainless steel, it's an exterior roof skin, and one is the inside wood skin, which is a wood floor, wall, ceiling. The metaphor for us for this project, the site was so vast that we thought it was important to actually explore the notion that uh, could we create a museum on a complete horizontal without uh, going uh, and taking an elevator or um, uh, a stair and thus destroying in a sense the continuity or the understanding of the project. And also the understanding that uh, in parallel um, we wanted somehow the, the whole collection which was a collection of different fragments from around the world to somehow be read as one thing which essentially kind of went, went against the very uh, grain of what the museum wanted. But in this case, uh, for us, we thought it was important. So we took the metaphor of a forest, and the idea in a forest that uh, there's two paths that exist, or two paths that are potentially interesting to work with. One is the path that exists, exists already, that's been pre-made. And the other is the path that's made by the spectator uh, or the path maker. Um, and by taking the metaphor of the forest and these, this notion of paths through the collection, we then went on and, uh, of course, you know, there's uh, artistic parallels uh, or cultural, I should say, parallels to those paths. And by moving on, we took the surface of the site, the entry here. The curve is this extraordinary curve, which is the River Seine here. The Eiffel Tower is here. Um, and the major entry is here. And the entry into our museum is here through one, two, three, four, four regions of the world, which the collection is broken into. But essentially, our idea was that we wanted a traverse uh, uh, traversing a series of paths that went through the collection and also the ability for someone to wander uh, around on a horizontal plate. And essentially also then the outside, these are outside spaces, becomes uh, a, just purely an extension of that. These are other programmatic volumes, but essentially the most important volume for the museum is here. So this is a model. 
um, of those volumes. Uh, essentially, the the main as I said, the main road is here. The entry is through here. The volumes for us were quite important. They they, they had these two skins. One, as I said, was in wood. One was uh, it's a little bit ambiguous as a model here, but the exterior skin being in uh, stainless steel. So we wanted to reflect the city and keep it quite urban as an exterior uh, skin. But the uh, the skin on the inside actually became a very soft uh, and uh, primary s s skin. And why that was interesting to us was because most of the collection, uh, there was a huge part of the collection which is made out of wood. And we were interested in also the notion that the collection uh, or the wood could somehow be related to the very notion of uh, early uh, ideas about architecture or the beginnings of, of, of built shelter. So we took the wood as a, as a kind of interior skin that becomes very interesting because it's also museographically interesting as well as spatially interesting to create a complete uh, space within the project. So if we look from the outside of the, mu of the museum that we proposed for the competition, here we have a, a skin which is in, uh, a stainless steel, as I said, and then we have these extraordinary, or what we felt were <laughs> extraordinary volumes on the inside, very, very high volumes, that once you get inside, become uh, very carefully uh, a series of paths and a series of this a little bit more minimal than what it really would be like, but a series of light conditions that would then, at times within the collection, there was these pieces called icon pieces. And for example, for the Aboriginal art uh, culture, we would take an icon piece that would then, in then introduce, let's say, a collection of 100 pieces. And we worked with this notion of light, which would be a light specific to uh, this part of Australia, and that would be directed on the icon, icon piece, or the iconographic piece. The notion that all of these pieces had somehow become lost from their original uh, location, and that we were very interested in somehow through light bringing back into uh, the relation with the piece, the context or the lighting conditions under which the, con the, the pieces had been conceptualized or had, had, be had lived in. Um, so that was kind of one aspect to our project. And as I said, the other aspect was very much this interest of moving across culture, that the world was not defined by four, uh, broken into four different uh, subgroups, uh, but that actually ideas uh, traverse across culture. They do not move in predictable paths. And all of this material, anyway, is constantly being uh, re-looked at in, by new eyes uh, as one generation surpasses another and new historical data comes along and reveals that actually this group in Samoa did not land on this island and then go to this other one, but in actual fact they come from somewhere else. So etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. These, these are the kinds of ideas that we were trying to, in a way, fight to, to get our project out there. Um, <clears throat> then we come to a project that we're building now in Paris. It's under construction. It has been for um, about five months. It's on the River Seine, and I'm showing it in relationship to the Branley Museum, because for us, again, it's this field project. Um, Ando, uh, of course, won the museum uh, for Pinot's museum in Paris. It's this huge mega building, which will be, will be built here, right opposite our project. Uh, right now, uh, the project is interesting because uh, Renault, the car factory in France, uh, the car group, sorry, in France uh, contacted us and again we did a competition to design a world uh, uh, communication center for them in, in, the, in the heart of Paris. The whole site is a very important site. It was where the cars originally were uh, assembled on this part of the site and also on the island. All of it was decentralized under Mitterrand in the uh, 70s and 80s. And uh, one of the last buildings which is still left on the site is this building that was built by an architect, and again working in the stomach of another architect, uh, uh, Claude Vasconi. Uh, and this is his project, which is this brick 
and uh, steel roofed thing. Now this, the, uh, this is a, a huge project. You can see the Seine here, and you can see the old factories of Renault, which are about to be torn down the, maybe the end of this year and the beginning of next with Ando's, uh, Ando's uh, project here. Our project is essentially all of this, but inside. What intrigued us about, of course, this project was the presence of its roofs. And the roofs are really interesting because, in a way, they're not just an angle which is uh, a very acute, but the logo we since, uh, uh, you know, since then being invited to the competition, we then got into analyzing it and we found out that the roof, in fact, is a breakdown of the logo of Renault, which is a, a, a six-sided, uh, slightly six-sided, um, distorted piece of geometry. And uh, essentially that logo then is repeated in these series of roofs. So the idea that then the brand or the, or the logo that created this roof was for the earlier architect from the 80s uh, kind of an important thing, but a very subtle uh, way in which he introduced this logo. What we did, we were in parallel to that, we were just also happened to be interested in the idea that these were light slots and somehow we could generate a project maybe from those light slots. So as we worked, this is the empty building, uh, an extraordinarily beautiful building as an existing piece. Our thing was to then try and work with these light slots and generate, unlike Pompidou where we worked with the floor, we then took the roof and decided that that was our new territory and we would uh, generate from that roof down. So in our project, what we did was we took the roof and by generating, we s uh, scanned or, or created a series of white uh, walls, what the French call cimes in some cases. And these white walls run east-west underneath the roofs and they fall in some cases all the way to the ground or they float. All the orange stuff is a series of uh, three offices for uh, 50 people in each, uh, a garage for cars, and then on this side of the project, uh, an amphitheater for 300 people, 100 people, 500 people, which each and each would have a uh, presentation space for an actual car, as well as a television studio, as well as a series of what we call the brainstorming rooms uh, for these people to then be able to move back and, uh, and discuss ideas. What's interesting in the, in the communication department of Renault, which is just like a sub-department of Renault, is that these guys who work here are interested and are looking two years, three years ahead of everyone else. They're not interested in what's happening now, they're interested in three, three years away. So their job is actually looking into the future and predicting what the future will be about. So it's a very interesting group of people to work with, but also quite sort of highly secretive in a way. So we had all sorts of fun how to introduce the public into also a, a, a project which for Renault is, is, a, is a, in, a, in a way a private space as well. So if we bring all of that to the ground in a kind of very simplistic way, our entry is here. Uh, we have a big glass uh, um, canopy, you know, a uh, glass roof in here. And then our major entry is through here into this huge uh, space, which is an exhibition space. And under these three floating offices, a big exhibition space. It's about, the whole project is about 14,000 meters squared. Uh, and, and I should say these white walls, the white seamers are very important because of course then they became also an excuse to direct natural daylight down into different fragments and different places across the project. So here is inside that space. Uh, it, there is a mezzanine walkway that runs right around. This side of the project can be completely closed off and become a series of conference rooms for Paris while this side can be an exhibition space for the public. The public will be coming through this place normally about six days a week, as well as, uh, as I said, behind these screens are a series of offices. And the public will at times be able to walk around the mezzanine as well. So the whole thing is kind of a multiple programmed space. It's a kind of a complex thing. Uh, in terms of how it can be broken down and then it can be sub-broken down, etc. But anyway, the plans are very simple. This, these are the th series of theatres, the brainstorming rooms as they come up. So all of this was in a sense then a series of 
removals or chops that were made through this kind of east-west moving strata to create these volumes and then create also the movement patterns of people between them and around them. And these, if we take one of these volumes, which is sort of these, these residual things, uh, this is in a way where what we're doing right now is we're in the process of building these volumes. So I just want to, it's very much a, a, a project uh, in process right now. This is a ground floor looking up through part of the mezzanine. In some ways, don't, the photos don't really show you enough, but I just wanted to introduce the photos just to give you an idea of a project which we're uh, in, in, in process with right now. <coughs> the house in Corsica. We don't know ever whether we will build this thing, but it was a fun, I mean, hopefully we will, but it's, a lot, it's been a long process and we're not very sure right now whether it's going to be built. But a client came to us. He had made his fortune uh, on the internet uh, <laughs> and then he lost it. And what happened was, it was in kind of an extraordinary story, is, uh, is that, of course, when he came to us, he was very wealthy. <laughs> and uh, he said, listen, I have a site, which is on the island of Corsica. Uh, and it's a piece of land which falls right down to the sea. And we went and visited the site. And it's this. Uh, more or less this, this piece of site here, which is a fantastic piece of property. There's two small rivers that break and create uh, boundaries down to this piece of beach, which is public but more or less private the way it's situated. Looking from the sea back to the site, the site is actually just here. And then from the site back to the sea, he was, uh, or is, you know, we're saying is, there we are, um, is, a, is a very interesting guy. He came to us from, uh, from what, I th what we thought was a very, uh, uh, with a very wonderful, I should say, with a wonderful program. He came to us and said, listen, I, uh, I've got this program that I've split down into two areas. Half of it is about the way I live today. And the other half is about how I want to live on this island. And if for everything I have in Paris, this is the absolute and opposite I want. So we thought at that point we have to have now the best client you could possibly ever wish for, conceptually. And, uh, and so we, we jumped in and worked with this guy. This is in, on the island of, of uh, Corsica. If any of you have been there, of course, this is the famous Maki which is, in a, in a way, the, the dense undergrowth that covers the island and, in a way, is part of the very psyche or part of the very uh, nature of, of the island and the people that live on the island of Corsica. And when that Mackie becomes cleared in some places, it lends to some fantastic uh, tree growth. So we worked very carefully with a landscape architect who we've been working with for a while now, who is a f fantastic character in the sense that he goes right into the micro uh, landscape aspects of the site. And uh, not that it generated a project so easily for us from the landscape, but from the, the land, yes. And what we proposed was in the end to take the land uh, and treat the land as a surface and a topographic surface and to think that with that topographic surface of the existing land, can we not then make a clone of that and pull the clone down below the existing topographic surface and then between the clone and the topographic surface create, uh, uh, let's say, a series of living conditions. Now what was really interesting about, these are process drawings, but what was really interesting about the uh, client was that he said, I want to live across the site. I don't want to just live in a house, but I want to wake up in the morning and be able to wander down uh, to the beach and then come up and stop for breakfast and then come up and stay around the middle of the site for lunch and then wander back to the upper part of the site in the evening. And then, because I am interested in Zen, I want a space in the trees 
and I also want uh, an area where I can exercise. So there was this kind of remarkable history of wanting to live across the site and in the site at different times of the day and different times of the year. And we talked about this a lot, which led then to a whole series of explor explorations. These are just kind of re uh, fast recapitulation of it. Um, but where we started to, of course, work with this notion of well, what, what is this stuff if it's the original, and what is this stuff if it's now this synthetic copy, uh, which we still didn't get to at the final, you know, where we stopped the project, but uh, very much interested in this notion that this stuff, this thin synthetic landscape, uh, should really become something quite special. But at one point, we, in working with these skins and in working with these inner uh, spaces, a little bit like Maison Puzzle, with the idea that the, the house is somehow partially underground and partially above, we started to open up the surfaces. And by opening those up and looking at the different cellular rooms that then could be made inside this house, we wanted the house for, to be used also as a, uh, um, a place where he could invite a lot of different friends over time. Um, once we opened the thing up and then skinned it back, then maybe we could open this up at different times of the day in different kinds of ways. So by opening it up, we came eventually to this idea that the skin could actually open at its intersecting points and that windows and essentially windows into the space uh, were no longer uh, um, uh, you know, uh, a hole but actually was the, uh, was the active surface which was uh, both an, an opening and closing thing. At this point we started working with uh, Ovarip in London and trying to come up with a series of uh, different methods to uh, uh, build and how could we make this thing uh, hydraulically opening a ceiling window uh, and not also become, as the French call it, a machine à gaz, uh, you know, an, an impossible machine to work with. Um, but again, he was extremely on board for all of this. And because he was involved in sort of the, the informatic world and, and the numeric world, he was extremely able to uh, jump uh, with all of these kinds of ideas and, and push us even further. So um, this is really where we left off with this house, at, uh, a piece of this bigger, broader house. We have no idea where we're going to be in the future with it, but the thing is on hold right now. This is a model that we produced for the FRAC in Orléans for a, an exhibition this year. Uh, of that ceiling, and it's for a uh, roof, I should say, and it's for a nature roof wall, because it really is more a roof skin. Okay, and then we come to. I mean, so we're closing the, you know, the presentation down now. Just in the last few projects, the uh, the World Trade Tower project. We were invited by the Max Protich Gallery in New York. Of course, you've, I'm sure you've heard thousands of times about this project. Um, uh, 60, 55 designers, architects from around the world were invited by the Max Project. After the catastrophe of the World uh, uh, Trade Center uh, and asked to uh, create a new World Trade Center. Well, we took, uh, we got the text from the Max Project, Max Project Gallery and we were sort of horrified with the idea that, uh, well, why was it taken for granted that we were going to create a World Trade Center on this side? Why not do something else? Why talk about trade? How can people talk about trade after such an event? Uh, for us, it seemed like a total absurdity. So we uh, scratched around and uh, thought that the best thing was to eliminate the notion of trade and money uh, and talk about bigger issues to do with the world today, which are notions of peace uh, and, uh, and, let's say, hope. Uh, and so we proposed a project where we got rid of the notion of, of trade, as I said, and it became the World Peace Project. So it was our, our way of, in a way, contributing what we felt uh, was necessary as an attitude to the site. It's not necessarily the project that should be on the site, but the attitude I thought was in, we thought was important to show. So we wanted to show something that was very delicate and uh, fragile, 
and non-demonstrative uh, working with these notions of peace. So we developed uh, eight very, very thin uh, fingers, which were later called critically uh, uh, grass, we never called them that, but I like the interpretation. And we located these on the site inside the existing envelopes of the building. So the gabbery or the envelope of the building uh, reaches just to this point of the original uh, towers. And these, uh, these fingers, we imagine now, um, it's a purely manifest of peace because we know that to live inside this, the thing would probably have to get fatter and undergo certain uh, changes, etc. But it was, a, it, this, it was the spirit of idea. And the, the exterior of these buildings or these habitations would be covered in a, a moving skin, an electronic skin, that would be constantly running messages vertically up and down each of the eight fingers. And these messages would carry uh, um, words which were related to both memory and the future. And in memory, we uh, pushed for the words like uh, love, memory, uh, peace, etc. And uh, the other half of the words were using what at that moment in time seemed to us critically important events in the world, such as Seattle, such as uh, uh, Tokyo, the Tokyo Agreement that had uh, been completely lost. Uh, so we incorporated the texts of Don't Forget uh, Seattle and, and, uh, and, and Remember Tokyo as uh, events that are critically important to the world, as, as just part of this ongoing issue of, you know, who are we, where are we going, uh, we, uh, you know, it's, there's unif all, all these kinds of problems are unified problems, uh, uh, and we all have to work together, etc., uh, etc., etc. Et so, this is our uh, proposition. The gabbery that I talked about uh, of the original building, of course, in plan, uh, the outline. And these are views looking down, and then uh, the piece was shown in the American pavilion at the the Biennale. Uh, the Las Biennale, as well as in the French Pavilion, where we built a, a, an extraordinarily high uh, model uh, and digitally cut uh, a mousse uh, and then fiberglass resin. And then this is a really, fa I'm going to show you this really fast because it's a project that we haven't ex explained very well visually and we rushed out of Paris grabbing a few images. So I don't think it's going to really do it justice, but uh, it was important to show you because it's something that we are in the process of trying to develop as a project and will hopefully build. Uh, it's a series of 100 apartments in Paris uh, that we won, won a recent competition for. And we thought it was important because it's, um, it, in a sense, is a, a development on from some of the earlier projects in some ways. It's how to live inside some of the stuff. Uh, and from these skins, we, uh, we have a site in Paris where there's three buildings. Uh, the urban plan was such that we wanted to build to the very exterior of those urban envelopes. And so vertically and horizontally, these openings are not us. So we're interested in taking the urban envelope and then making a softer uh, um, uh, envelope within that urban envelope, giving thus the uh, final form of the building. The building is interesting because it's in France, we're undergoing a, a radical, uh, or we think it's radically, radically important for the architects. It's a thing called HQE, which is high quality environmental rules, which are coming into force. I think in countries like Germany, they have been for years. The French are a bit slow on this kind of thing. But finally, they're coming into force and forcing us, whether we like it or not, to start to think about environmental issues to do with issues like if this building is made out of so-and-so X material, if it's demolished in 20 or 30 years' time, can that X material be recuperated and built or used again in, inside another building? Or if it is, uh, uh, um, you know, re, uh, reused, uh, crushed, broke, broken down and, uh, and reused, reconstituted, I should say, then, then these are the kinds of arguments that Ashku Ashku was all about, as well as et cetera, et cetera, other issues to do with thermic movement, air movement, uh, etc. Uh, uh, so the, the issues that came into these buildings is we had to all of a sudden change gear and work within these kinds of new problems. 
These are uh, some very quick diagrams showing the envelope breakdown, the inner core, the envelope breakdown of, some, of, of one of those buildings and one of those buildings from the outside as we're working on it. As I said, it's very, I don't really give you any context here, so I'm feeling a bit uh, guilty about not explaining it better, but hopefully we'll be able to show it to you sometime in the future. And then I wanted to end on the notion of some furniture, but uh, for us furniture, you know, it's your, maybe it's your classic response by an architect, but the furniture is always an extension of what you do and vice versa. And these are two pieces that we did for a furniture company, Soya and Moroni, in Milan, uh, that are, can, uh, are again, in a sense, like domestic totems, where one places one's object, uh, or books, or whatever you want. Uh, and they're pieces, in a sense, that also, I think, bring about or force the domestic environment. We would like to think that they also have an influence on the domestic environment that they are impossible to place, except maybe in the middle of the space, and all of a sudden, or to the side of the space, but all of a sudden they become, in a, in a sense, a kind of presence that one has to deal with. Uh, anyway, there are pieces that we produced this year, and uh, I essentially, I, well, I wanted to show you that. <laughs> so uh, this is another one of them. Uh, which comes out of a, a similar kind of territory. Okay. Again, uh, the ideas from this are related to the, in many ways, to the bookstore uh, uh, by Flor Florence Lowy. Uh, but here we're moving into another world of meta metacrylite and, uh, and the transparency of that and seeing what else we can do along these lines. So um, that's it. Does, any, does anyone have any questions? I don't mind if you, or if you want to zoom off, that's cool. <laughs> you want to zoom off? I'm, okay.